There is a house in New York City they call the house of death. And it's been... I don't know what I'm doing anyway. <laughs> Hello, true spookers, scarers, whatever it is. Today's video is the story of the house of death. Viewer discretion is advised. So this is part ghost story and part true crime story. This is a combo. The House of Death was actually constructed way back in 1856. Back when I was in my third year of kindergarten. Again, not a very smart person I was. It was a Greek brownstone building that resides in Greenwich Village in New York, New York. And it's located on West 10th Street. Many people have lived in this building. It started off as being just kind of like a, a normal home, and then eventually it was turned into an apartment building. It one time housed the founder of the Metropolitan Underground Railroad, and also the founder of the Broadway Underground Railroad. His name was James Borman Johnson. After his death, his wife and children would remain in the house, uh, which was around the 1880s or so. Apparently, the house is also known for just bad luck. In 1897, a, uh, a cycling, a bike, bicycle person, famous bicycle person, Fred Andrew, was riding his bike right in front of his house when he struck a young boy, ran him over with his bike. The boy ended up getting a broken leg, but he survived, and I think the the guy was arrested. But he actually lived in that house as well. The most famous resident of the House of Death is actually a man named Samuel Clemens, but you probably know him as Mark Twain. He is a legend of the American literature. Mark Twain only lived in the house for some time, like around a year-ish. At this point, he is kind of towards the tail end of his career, and he is kind of depressed and living kind of a sad life. But he also had heard about how the history of this house, how there was reported ghosts being seen in this home. So over the course of time, apparently roughly 22 people died in this building. And dating back to the late 1800s or so, there had been numerous reported sightings of ghosts in this building. There had been the sounds of footsteps, the horrible odors coming from the house. There has been phantom animals being seen in there. The <laughs> laughter of, of children and, and people crying. But Mark Twain didn't believe any of that because Mark Twain was in a very very staunch skeptic. He did not believe in this stuff whatsoever. However, he would end up writing a book, I guess, based on his time there in the house. And it was like a, it was a ghost story. On one particular evening, this is a directly a recollection from Mark Twain himself, he saw a piece of firewood in the home essentially levitate and begin floating near the fireplace. There was no one else there. No one was holding it. It was just floating, and he took out a gun, a pistol he had, and he shot the piece of wood, and then it fell to the ground. He even stated that when he looked at the piece of wood after he shot at it, there were a few drops of blood on that piece of wood and on the ground. Even though Mark Twain himself says that he did not see anybody or anything, he didn't see a rat, he didn't see anything, he still claimed it was a rat he must have shot, and that a rat was responsible for lifting this piece of wood off the ground, even though there was no rat carcass. Now, obviously, New York is known for rats, uh, but this particular home had never really had a history of rats. And so, but him being this big skeptic was like, nope, I'm not believing it. I don't care what I saw, not believing it. Here's an explanation for it, science. Uh, but many people do believe that, I mean, could this, this is a story that directly came from him. And based on how he described it, many people believe that that was truly a ghost that did that. Where the blood came from, though, I don't know. He moved out of the house by 1901, and on April 21st, 1910, he died of a heart attack. People who were then living in the House of Death, which is what it became nicknamed, uh, people who lived there over the course of time said 
they started to see the ghost of a mustachioed man kind of roaming around the house. Mark Twain was very uh, notably had a very prominent mustache. In the 20s through the 30s, there would be a ton of sightings of this mustachioed man kind of just sort of walking around the house or the building aimlessly. A woman and her daughter were living in the home at one point, and they say that one night they saw a mustachioed man uh, sitting on a or by a window. He was inside their home, and it was very clear to them that this was a person. And they kind of approached him by saying, how did you get in here? Who are you? And this person, this entity, this whatever, responded to them. And it said, quote, my name is Clemens, and I has a problem here. I gotta settle. End quote. And then within a few seconds, he vanishes right before their eyes. Mark Twain, at the time he lived in the house, was actually, he had been going through bankruptcy and he was having some financial issues. He was having a problem uh, with money. And so that's what some people have attributed to the, I have a problem here, I gotta settle part of that quote. Some people think that. But then also at the same time, Mark Twain didn't die in the house. He died elsewhere. But it is, it has been known before. Again, if you believe in this sort of thing, which I do, sometimes a ghost will haunt a place it's been in in the past but didn't die in. Perhaps his ghost haunts that building because he was such a skeptic and now he's like, oh, never mind. I guess people can see me. <laughs> By the late 50s, a, an author by the name of Jan Bryant Bartell, she moved into the building. Her and her daughter had moved into an apartment because at that point, the building had been turned into apartments. The apartment they lived in had once been the, uh, the house where servants stayed back when it was just one, a, a one, you know, one house. Within a day or so of her moving into this apartment, she began to see what she quoted as saying is a monstrous shadow and it would move, you know, back and forth. That on a couple of occasions, this humongous shadow person was literally following her around the house. Another occasion she said she saw, just flat out saw a full body apparition of a man just standing in her hallway, staring back at her. No thanks. I don't need to see that. But when she saw this man, she actually reaches out to touch him to see what, what I guess he, he feels like, I don't know. When she touched it, she said it felt like a substance without substance. She said it was the most bizarre thing she ever felt. It was chilly and damp, but then her hand wasn't damp afterwards, it was dry. She said it almost appeared as like a mist or a haze in the person's form. And then it just vanished. The Bartell family also said they smelt some really foul odors. Uh, they've seen the ghost of a cat roaming around. And there was a reported story about, like, oh, so I guess she called in some kind of paranormal investigator or a, a psychic to look into this building. And the psychic said that they felt or they know that Buried in the house is the body of, of a dead cat, a baby, and at least one other person who died in the home that was just buried somewhere in the house. Have those bodies ever been dug up or found? No. But the numerous tenants over the years who had like small animals like cats or small dogs, I guess they their animals would become really agitated by something that the animals saw. And this may have likely been this ghostly cat that was like causing havoc. Uh, but many residents would smell really horrific smells, but also sometimes like cigar smells and sweet perfume type, type odors, just kind of coming out of nowhere. When Miss Bartell had the psychic come there and you know, she said all oh, the bodies buried somewhere in this house, they also said that there are at least 22 spirits living in this house. And I, I can't find like a record of the people who've died in this house, but it doesn't sound like it's that far-fetched. Uh, just given the fact that it was built in 1856 and then the Bartels are living there in the late 1950s, it kind of, you know, 22 people over that course of time is not totally unheard of, especially in the late 1800s when people kind of died frequently and, and you're at younger ages. 
There has also been the ghostly apparition of a woman in a white dress. There have been sightings of a young girl running around the hallways, laughing and playing, and then just disappears. Miss Fartell wrote a manuscript about her time at that house because that they eventually moved out of it. And she was soon to be publishing that manuscript. Right after she was done and just before it was published, uh, Miss Bartell, who I guess was having issues with depression and had reportedly attempted suicide a couple of times, or had at least suicidal thoughts, she died, um, mysteriously, I guess, shortly after leaving the house of death and writing that manuscript. A lot of people have said the house is cursed and that when she left the house, she was doomed to die soon. And then the most recent tragic event to occur in the house of death is an actual murder. It was November 2nd, 1987. At 6.40 a.m., 911 receives a phone call that a little girl living in this building, she was unconscious. It was a woman who said it was her daughter and that her daughter wasn't breathing. When paramedics arrived, they walked into this home and they found this six-year-old girl lying nude on the kitchen floor. And her little brother, Mitchell, was tied to his playpen and sitting in a pile of his own urine. The mother had a nust bomb. She also appeared to have been bruised and beaten. The six-year-old girl, Lisa, was rushed to the hospital. She was still alive when they picked her up, but unfortunately she would pass away within a day or so of her being brought to the hospital. Police search the house and they find a ton of cocaine. They find 20 crack pipes, $25,000 in cash, and several other drugs. For, at the autopsy, they determined that Lisa had died from severe blunt force trauma. She had been beaten severely. And this was primarily to her skull. And right away, the there were two people arrested. Her parents, Joel Steinberg and Hedda Nussbaum. Joel Steinberg was a prominent attorney there in New York City. And once Lisa died, so initially they were char both charged with abuse, but then when she died a couple of days later, they, they were both then charged with first degree murder. However, police had looked at Hedda and said, you know, obviously she's been a victim. She clearly was beaten. She had bruises all over her body. She seemed to be terrified. And it was later discovered that she was being beaten by her husband, Joel. Um, and she agreed to testify against him at a trial, and if she did so, and she cooperated, she wouldn't be charged with anything. Joel Steinberg would then go on trial for the murder of Lisa, and a jury would actually find him guilty of manslaughter in the second degree. He received a very short prison sentence and was released in 2004. Jesus, this guy looks scary. Ugh. Yeah. It was said that Joel had beaten Lisa because he, he was going somewhere and Lisa wanted to go with him. And he was mad that she kept insisting on going. I mean, she's a six-year-old kid who wanted to go somewhere with her dad. And he didn't like that. And he was already uh, just out of his mind on cocaine at that point. And he ended up beating her over the head with a hammer. That's what he used. A hammer over his six-year-old girl's skull. And it's just another kind of example of how the house may be cursed and how it's tragic. It's just, just one of those places. The building still stands today. There have been no recent reported deaths or anything uh, evil happening inside the home, other than people still seeing the apparitions of ghosts and, and phantom smells and people being like brushed by someone, someone being, being touched by someone, but there has been no other like evil acts that have taken place in the building that I'm aware of. Perhaps it's all just coincidence or perhaps the building is just doomed for non-stop evil and death, murder and chaos. But if you ever choose to enter the building, hopefully you will leave the house and not become another member of the house of death. 
And that is it for this story. True crime Maroonie or Noonie Ding Dongs. Whoops, said that wrong. Anyway, hi, my name is Mike. If you're new to my channel, I typically tell true crime stories here, but this week I've been telling a spookier kind of story, sort of, just to do something different for a little bit, you know? But normally it's true crime, so please feel free to subscribe and give the video a like so more people can see it. I also tell short form true crime stories and the occasional spooky story over on TikTok on a couple different pages. The links to those are going to pop up here in the corner in the beginning and the end of the video. And the links to my TikToks are also in the link tree in the description of this video below. Also in the link tree, you'll find my merch store. We sell like t-shirts and hoodies and stuff and we do ship all over the entire world. So check it out if you want to. Then lastly, if there is a true crime case or maybe a spooky story slash haunted place you would like me to cover eventually, uh, just send me a really quick email. My email is listed in the description as well. And just send me the name of the case or the house or the haunted place, uh, where it is, when it all kind of happened, whatever the case may be, and I'll add that name to my list. The list is currently 6,300 plus names long. I pick these at random typically, so I can't promise you when I'll cover that particular story, but I will at some point, so yeah. Anyway, that's it for the video, so ta ta for now, and we'll see you for the next video. Program. I don't know. I don't know either. I just, just ignore me. I, ugh, this guy.